Hey, everybody, this is Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is the Duluth Pack podcast, Leader of the Pack. Our special guest today is Ali Jutin. She is an influencer of Ali Up North and owner of Empower Outdoors LLC. Allie, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's good to have you here. We're going to learn all about you today and all <laughs> your, your history and how you got to be an entrepreneur and, and work your way through that. And hopefully hear some great outdoor stories because we know you are so much of an outdoor person. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm excited to be here and share whatever you ask. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what, Allie, tell us where you grew up. Tell us what your childhood was like. You know, I am local to the Duluth area, but I grew up in Hermantown and Friedenburg. So when I was little, I grew up um, in Friedenburg, just outside of Hermantown area, Duluth area, in um, a house with a bunch of acres and grew up outside, walking around barefoot, like, you know, that type of childhood where I laid in mud puddles and, and, you know, picked wild strawberries and that type of thing. Um, my, my dad was a hunter. My, all my families are hunt, family members are hunters. And so I kind of grew up in that hunter gather type environment, I guess. So you had some dirt under your fingernails. Oh yeah, definitely. Perfect. It's funny that today in these days, homesteading is such a um, trend. Like there's, it's very trendy right now. And it's just like, the way that I grew up. It's kind of fun. Well, what tell us what you mean about that when you were growing up, kind of like, uh, you know, did you guys have a big garden? Did you, did you big garden? Something? Just, yeah. And, um, just canning and, and just the way that using food that you provide yourself, that you grow yourself, that you shoot yourself, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So very much kind of down to earth. Uh, let's say, you know, if we're, if we're going to hunt it, we eat it. If we're going to grow it, we eat it and share it. Yeah. I think there was one summer that we had zucchini in like every single meal. Cause we had so much zucchini in the garden, like <laughs> zucchini, spaghettis, zucchini cakes, just everything fried zucchini. I was so sick of it. <laughs> All right. What was your favorite thing to get then? Oh, I love just what the, we had a strawberry garden and I loved just being able to pick strawberries and just eat them right there, you know. So with the strawberries, did you guys have uh, bear issues from black bears? We did have some bears. I don't remember it being a huge issue. My dad actually had a bear tag at one point and shot a bear. So I don't know if that fixed the problem or, <laughs> or what, but um yeah, no, I, it, I don't recall a lot of issues with bears, but I have seen a few bears in my day there. Okay. So you get out of high school. Where do you go to college? What are your, your dreams and aspirations at that point? What's Allie going to do? Gosh. Oh, my dream. So I went to college um, at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, and I got a degree in journalism and international relations because I wanted to travel. I just wanted to write, travel, work for National Geographic or something like be an embedded reporter in some military or something. Just just do long form journalism and tell stories of real people. I guess not necessarily the type of news like that's, you know, local news. I was more wanting to do the long form, like international reporting. Um, I didn't do that, obviously. <laughs> so I'm very much rooted back to home. Uh, I think that has to do with who I married. He was a farmer. So we, um, we live on a farm now and it it's, if you know anything about farming, you have to be around. So it's very much like a rooted lifestyle. So what, what do you farm now? Um, well, my husband's family has had a black Angus beef cattle farm for over a hundred years. Yeah. How many head of cattle do you have? Um, I, well, we, we 
do a cow calf operation right now, but, but that's actually something I'll talk about is the changes that we're making to the farm. Um, so right now it's a cow calf operation, which means that we, you know, our cows, we breed our cows with our bulls. And then this time of year, like through the winter for starting in around January, they have all their babies, um, till about now, um, maybe into June. Um, and I think we had 150 babies this year. So yeah, it's, it's an, a lot larger than you would think. Um, Holy cow. Yeah. A hundred and, and how many babies? 150 babies. Holy so some God. of them are twins, right? So, sure. but yeah. Wow. Wow. Let's get into that in a little while here. Yeah. But, so your, your aspirations are, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to yeah. be this national geographic, uh, uh, reporter and, uh, and you start local. Oh Yeah. Yep. Tell us I all did. about it. Well, you know, <laughs> I graduated college and decided, you know, I was dating my husband. We've been together 10 years. So um, we were dating. I didn't want to just move off somewhere. I wanted to be near, near him. <laughs> and I didn't really have an exact plan except for I wanted to be near him and I needed a job. So I got a job at um, Midwest Communications as a, I started as an intern and then I got a job as a reporter and I did like newscasts, weekend newscasts, just probably the worst shift ever, like 4.30 in the morning, um, weekends, Saturdays, Sundays, and city council meetings. Like, honestly, no offense to reporters that do that stuff. <laughs> it's the boringest stuff that I, I mean, it's important stuff, but it's also boring to me. And I am very much fueled by like projects and things that like I like, and I'm passionate about, and I do better work that way. Um, there's only so much I can give to those types of things. <laughs> how, how long did you work then for Midwest? You know, I worked there, I mean, not including the internship, probably 10 months. And then I worked at Marisa's and I still fill in sometimes. So it wasn't a super long time that I worked for uh, Midwest Communications. Um, and it was a good experience overall. I just needed, um, I, I shifted again, I pivoted away from that because I discovered it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So I just feel like throughout my life, I've learned that pivoting is okay. Um, and that was a pivot that I got away from. Allie, did you know at that time then that, you know, maybe I started here local and my aspirations were to go to something really big and do this international yeah. travel in that pivot? Did you know that maybe that's not in the cards anymore before you went to your next career at Maurice's Corporation? Um, I kind of thought maybe it's not in the cards um, just because I'm like, I don't know if that's what I want because I can't. It's like it's like those dreams as a kid of wanting to be a rock star. But then you, when you actually realize what that lifestyle is, it's so much different because I have musicians in my family. It's very, very much different than what you, you know, you just get to sing and then you get to go home. No, you have to do this and this and this and stay up late. And you, you literally they call it a rock star lifestyle for a reason. The same thing with, you know, working for a, a company like or doing international reporting, you're traveling. And I didn't necessarily want to do that anymore, I guess, be away for extended periods of time. If I was single, I would have, but I wasn't. So. Okay. So you go yeah. to Maurice's corporation after being at Midwest communication, what did that transition look like? And what did you begin doing there? You know, I got hired there as a temporary new store coordinator. And so I helped open new stores and coordinate all the projects for construction, um, coordinate with the stores, talking to store managers and training and working with trucking companies and construction companies and punch lists and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I helped open a bunch of new stores um, for probably a year until um, I got to do a little bit more with communications because I was on the, the communications team, the store operations team um, at Maurice's. And so I got to start doing different projects that like they need, needed help with. And I had the skill set for it, just that wasn't my job title. 
Um, so I, I kind of got to show some of the things I could do. And then um, the communications team and IT were working on building an internet. So internal communications for the stores. And I know HTML, at least enough to be dangerous. So they needed somebody to, to um, manage that internet and post content and do things on it and build forms. And so I ended up kind of taking over IT's role in what they would do for the internet and the communications team. And, and um, they created a role for me called the operations and content specialist. So what didn't exist before me, but um, they needed me to do it. So I worked there for a while. What does that entail? And what did you, what, what, what did you do? What did I do? Um, so the, a lot of different things. So store operations in the retail spectrum, which you're, you're, you might have a, do you have a store operations team or anything like that? You have. Maybe we're, we're, not pretty, a, we're pretty small. We're not quite right. that big. Right. No. Okay. So with, within Maurice's, they have over a thousand stores, right? So the store ops team is basically the last stop before anything goes to the store. So if you have marketing materials, you have visual direction, you have um, new product um, you want to train them on or HR coaching situations, anything that, or even a POS change, like if you have something at the registers, anything that happens, it has to go through store ops before it goes to the stores because um, basically we have the direct relationship. We had the direct relationship with the stores and know kind of how the stores work. So say the marketing team wants to talk about something that doesn't make sense to the stores and we, we would say it better and we'd get all that information and present it in a way that would make sense for the stores and they got all their information through the internet. So it's their internal internet, right? So they they could go on their computer or POS and, and pull up all their training materials, HR materials, forms. Um, there might be like um, news stories or whatever, highlighting the manager of the month or whatever it was. I don't remember everything now, but um, anything that went on there, I would do. So I, I'd be writing things or I'd make sure things are posted or I'd build forms or whatever it was. Um, so I did that, but then a lot of other projects just on the operations side of things. So um, now, now that's five years ago now. So now I'm not really thinking about everything that I did, um, but it, it really was just helping the stores operate more efficiently and, and get more sales. So, um, yeah. So how long were you at Maurice's? Um, it was nearly five years. I think it was four and a half years. Okay. Four and a half. Yeah. And then, and then you, you start another transition, but, but before we get to that, and we, we talk about you becoming an entrepreneur, which I guess, everything you do now is an entrepreneur. Uh, but let's talk about this farming operation a little oh. bit. I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. <laughs> so so oh. how, many, how many total cattle? If you had 150 babies this spring, how many cattle do you have? Oh my gosh. This is, um, this is, this is like, like watching mm, Yellowstone. Oh gosh, you're funny. Oh, um, you know... I need to ask on how many, because I think they're, cause we do sell, we, we sell the calves when, once they get to market. That's the, once it gets to the point where we, they're weaned and they can be sold at market. So they'd be sold, you know, to other farms. Right. So I don't know at, at, at this time it's like double. So 200 something. Okay. Two to 300 ish. So, so how much land do you have to have to have 200 cows? For lay people like me who just likes to go to the store and have a big old ribeye. Um, I don't know how much you technically sh need to have, like if there's legal stuff, but I know that the farm has about 1300 acres. Holy moly. So, okay. I'm, I'm going to play the dumb old guy here. You ever lose a cow? Oh yeah. You know, one of the first times that me and Nick were dating, they, they, uh, 
someone comes in the house and they, Hey, there's a calf in the creek. We got to go and, you know, get the calf out of the creek or, you know, or they'll get on the road every once in a while. It, it happens. It's not ideal if someone breaks a fence or something happens, but no, you, you, they, they are very well like taken care of because when you go somewhere every single day, um, when you, you know, take care of them every single day, you kind of know what you're looking for, you know? how many there should be. I don't know if, um, Jay, Nick's uncle or grandpa, they're the ones that work every single day on the farm. Mm -hmm. Um, if they, you know, they, they all have numbers, right. They're all, they all ear tags and numbers, but I don't know that they, they lost cows. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I don't know that they've lost them, lost them, but things happen. Situations happen where they, you know, get out or, going somewhere where they shouldn't go last spring i'm in nebraska i'm uh, at a turkey hunting camp and mm. i got myself in big trouble because i called the guy a farmer oh. and his hands were big enough where he could have squeezed my head like a grape because he's got like a thousand head of cattle and he said mm. i would not be a farmer i am a rancher please don't make that mistake again yeah so you guys are ranchers i guess I think you're right that technically it would be a ranch, but I am not the one to tell the family that's been farming for 120 years that it's a ranch. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. So, um, it, it, it could be, it could be a ranch, okay. but I know that, that people are like that, that especially in that Nebraska, that really that beef area, they are definitely, definitely have particular things that they want to be called either ranchers or farmers i also river falls i went to a, it was a big agricultural school um and in some of my classes i was with in with a few farmers and you could tell who the dairy farmers were who the horse people were who the cattle farmers who the crops farmers all these different types because they were super like biased in their own way that they didn't even realize it but i as an outsider could see like it was super obvious so yeah, there's some particular things that people have. And again, I don't know. I think it's a, a ranch. I think you might be right, but <laughs> it, it's a farm thing, to me. You know, the, the other thing that, that I learned was, and the reason I asked the question, have you ever lost a cow is because I'm down at this camp on a, a, a turkey hunt and the owner of the camp said, I will not be joining you for dinner tonight because I got a phone call from the neighbor who happened to be several miles away. Right. And he goes, I think like 20 or 50 or cows are down here. They're in the river. Mm. And so until one in the morning, they had to go get their cows and <laughs> bring their cows back home who had gotten underneath a fence and decided to take a walk at about three miles down a river. And that's one of the reasons I ask, because I, I asked him as well, is how often do you lose cows? And he goes, all the time. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of what happens, but they are very large thousands, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that I could see that happening. If, if, if you have that much space that, that you're talking about, I, I know those types of, of farms and, or ranches <laughs> and uh, yeah, I could see that happening. For so sure. what are, what are some of the challenges, you know, being, being that your husband is, uh, and we'll get into this whole alley up North thing. I'm just intrigued right That's now. Fine. That's Hell fine. Yeah. No, um, it's what, actually what, good mean, that you're asking. Um, because we are in the process of trying to shift some things at the farm and try to sell beef direct to consumer, um, rather than just at market. So, um, it's, we're even like rebranding a piece of the farm to do that and sell different products like um, honey and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're in the process of actually doing that, getting a logo and we're getting our website done Well, I'm doing the website. Um, (laughs) I I was going to ask that question. I was going to (laughs) say, let me think. I I think I can guess who's doing the website and who's going to be doing all the marketing here. Yes. Yep. (laughs) Yep. So Yes. So we're doing, we're in the process of, of doing some, some stuff with the farmer to try and um, sell the beef. 
Can you so. can you share that with us at this time? Yeah, or is this, okay, I, well, I can. Us, I just give us um, the handles and the name so that if we have listeners who are like, no, I'd love to go and support a local company like this and local people. And, and we had some people. What What is the brand and how can they find you? Yeah. So um, the website is not live yet, but it will be hopefully by the time this podcast comes out. Um, it's Duluth Farming Company and it's going to be Duluth Farming Co. No, DuluthFarming.co is what it will be. Um, and you'll, you'll do social media for it. So you'll, you know, people can follow yeah. you and see how things are going and then they can find out, you know, what beef prices are. If I want to buy, you know, would it be, would it be buying a, a half a cow, a quarter, or could, are you going to go into, Hey, no, you can just come and buy steaks. Yeah. So I think or hamburgers. the route that we are, the, the route that we're planning on taking and, and what's in the works would be beef boxes. So you could do, you know, a hamburger box or, you know, with a certain amount of hamburger in there. So say it's our 10 pound box or 20, you know, um, and then there would be other different boxes with different cuts of meat. So, um, you know, you might have a roast, you might have steaks and hamburger and, you know, different things in a box because, what we found at least with who, who we would think our target market would be is people who want to buy local, but they maybe don't necessarily have the freezer space um, of somebody with, that wants a quarter of a cow. So we might still do quarters. Yeah. I'm not sure on that yet, um, but for sure the beef boxes for, for those that can't necessarily fit a whole half or quarter of a cow, but they do want to support a local um, operation, a local farm. Oh, that is awesome. And I'm going to definitely be doing that because, uh, I've been known to eat a steak or two. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned honey. So in your spare time, what you got bees, <laughs> you know? Um, so the honey is actually a family friend who has been a beekeeper for a while. And he's just like literally down the road from us that he wants to sell his honey and he's going to, um, we're going to, he already has a bottle, but we'll label it under Duluth Farming Company. He'll be on the website as our beekeeper, that kind of thing. Eventually, we want to move bees and have a hive on the farm as well. Um, it's just not right now. Uh, but we, we, we do have honey and um, some other bees wax type products that we'll be selling. And then, um, yeah, so it, it's still local and it's, it's still, it, it's a family friend that will be our beekeeper, basically. Yeah. That is awesome. So now let's talk about what, what you uh, have been doing to keep you pretty busy lately. Let's talk about Alley Up North and Empower Outdoors. Yeah. Well, I will say that the farm stuff, that is my like latest thing that's going to keep me very busy. So that is good that we talked about that. Um, so Alley Up North is something, it's it's me, right? It's just, it's, I am Allie and I live up North, right? So that name kind of came about organically. It wasn't something that I was intentionally like branding myself as, um, it was just kind of, Oh, this is cool. Like Allie up North. Cool. Um, it, it turned into what it is today. Um, just based on people starting to follow me on social media and, um, knowing me knowing learning as I went and kind of working in at Reese's and working in content and um it kind of created my own I created my own brand basically. Mm -hmm. Um but it is it is me. It's not I try I try to be as authentic as I can just trying to share real things, real moments. Um, I'm a mom now so I do share my kids. Some people um I try to include them on anything outdoors that I do. Um, and some people, you know, try to keep their page still about them kind of thing. And mine's kind of shifted. It's always changing and it, it breaks all the rules on social media anyways. Um, as far as when I say rules, I mean like algorithm rules. Mm -hmm. If you're a social media uh, manager, you understand what I'm talking about, but Otherwise, yeah, the algorithms like it when you do the same thing, right? They like it when you show the same type of content um, to your followers. And so I, 
I tend to break those rules all the time because I am not just one thing. I, I, I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like all things outdoors, but I'm also a mom. I also do other things. So I break some rules there. Um, and then with uh, Empower Outdoors, that is my business name. Empower Outdoors LLC is, is my business name, but it's also the, the name of my podcast that I haven't done an episode in a while probably two years. So it's been a while. <laughs> so it's something okay. that I want to get back into. Um, but it isn't something that I have time for right now, as far as um, where I can prioritize my time. So I haven't done it in a while. But but basically, the podcast was to empower and inspire people to get outside and try hunting and fishing and all that. And I want to do a 2.0 version of that with uh, kids involved, right? Because I feel like there's a lot of uh, Empower Outdoors stuff that I could do um, and content that I, I could, interviews that I could could be done with involving kids because people always have questions like, how do you, what type of gear do you use and how do you get your kids outside or how do you take a kid hunting? I mean, that just seems crazy, right, to some people. But um, anything is doable if you have the right mindset, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so when you started your podcast, it's Empower Outdoors, was it interviewing people or was it you doing things in the outdoors? So it was mostly interviews with people. Um, there was, I, I had a, a co-host, which was my cousin, Phil. I think you, you were on the podcast. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now. Um, but Phil and I co-hosted it together. And a few of the episodes was just us talking about different topics. Like we did some turkey hunting episodes. I interviewed my dad for one for uh, maple syruping. Um, I had other guests on, on as well that had different expertise. So I had um, the last interview I did was with Scott Ellis, who's like a national grand champion turkey caller. And so, I mean, his, his, interview is very much focused on communication with turkeys, which isn't something that's talked about as much as the hunting part. Like people like to talk about turkey hunting, but they don't actually know how to speak the language. Right. And he was talking about how to actually speak their, their language and really getting into that, which is like way above me. You know, I can call, but I, I can't communicate like he can. So there was different experts like that, that I would try to bring on the show. Um, to talk about different things related to the outdoors or different products like Duluth Pack, that kind of thing. So what was your favorite interview ever? Oh, goodness. I, 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 I'm trying to think. You can't say you can't say the one on me. So yeah. that one's out the window. Oh, uh, you know. Hmm. I thought it was. Gosh, there was a lot of there was a lot of great um people that were on the show, um, man, I had a guy named Scott Einsman on the show who worked for at the time, the archery trade association. So, and he like built his own bows. He just is like an archery nerd and no offense. He would claim himself an archery nerd. Um, he talked a lot about that. Now he works for outdoor life gear. So he's the editor for that. So like people like that, that, um, that interview was fun. There was, gosh, I can't think of all of them. They were all, there was all a lot of really great interviews. Um, and that's why I want to do more, but it like, as you know, doing podcasts is it's work. It's a lot of work and, um, someday I'll get back to that. But right now I'm, I've been focusing on other things. How many total episodes did you tape? Do you know, I think I did 25. Okay. Yeah. And how could people find those if they want to look? Do they look at Empower Outdoors for um, so them? There's, um, there, and what platform? Yeah, they're still on all the platforms like Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, you know, Anchor, whatever platform that you can listen to podcasts on, they should be there. Um, and then they're also on my website, alleyupnorth.com. So I have, that's my, my uh, business website. It's kind of branded towards... Um, the alley up north side of things, but Empower Outdoors is the name of my business, which is where I um, 
I basically I operate doing digital marketing, content marketing, that kind of stuff. But it having the alley, I have two different brands, right? So the alley up North brand um, helps my empower outdoors business. So. Absolutely. Sure. And, you know, when you, when you transitioned Ali from corporate world to now going to be an entrepreneur. So first of all, what, what drove you to that? And, and what, you know, how was that to take that leap that, oh boy, here I go. And I'm, I'm jumping in. You know, at the time it was, I was having you know, thoughts about things going on at Maurice's that I just was like, ah, I think I need a change. Um, but then I went to the Outdoor Writers Association of America conference. It, it was in Duluth and that was now five years ago. And on Monday I quit my job. Wow. I, I put in my notice. So basically that conference, it's not that it was like, it, it was a really, it was a good conference. Like Steve Vernella spoke at it. That was really cool to hear him speak. Um, and it just made me realize that there are people out there that are writing and doing work in the outdoor spectrum, like hunting, fishing, hiking, foraging, like all this stuff. And they're making a living off of it somehow. Right. And, and, I have a degree in journalism. I like hunting. I like fishing. And I'm also just looking at that time at that conference, there was not a lot of young people and not a lot of females. So I'm like, hmm, there's space for me here. I think I could make this work. Basically. <laughs> so I, I go back, I put in my two week notice and I'm jumping in head over heels. What is the one thing, Allie, when you started on your own venture that you just didn't expect? What was one thing I didn't expect? I didn't expect to, I didn't know how to price myself for one, because you don't really value your work as much as it should be valued. I feel like maybe that's just me, but I feel like a lot of people do that. Um, uh, let's see. Hmm. You find that a lot when entrepreneurs start in a venture, they, they want to have business, you need an income stream. And so that they, they start to putting their value at a low dollar value because they want the revenue to come. They want to see return customers and you probably undervalue, as you said, yourself and what your product is, which in your case was you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, a lot of times I could have a conversation with someone that's wanting to start a business, for example, and I don't realize it at the time, but my knowledge is literally valuable, you know, in certain, in certain ways, like the social media side marketing and not that you can't help out a friend, but it's like, Oh, then it makes you think I could, instead of, I could package this somehow and make a course or different things like that, where where you realize your value a little bit more as you go. Um, I think one thing I did learn throughout doing, you know, doing this for a few years is that pricing yourself is hard, but you have to know how to take, you know, take what you know, put a value to it and, you know, get that value for it. But at the same time, on the flip side, one thing that's really important to me is building relationships and maintaining those relationships. So sometimes you might have a, a client, you know, it, sometimes your prices might differ on based on your client too. So even though I, I might be worth X amount of dollars for whatever skill set that I am putting forth. Right. Um, if I know that that is way out of a client's price range, but I do want to work with that client and I believe in that client, what they do, then I can try to work with them and maybe do a different approach to, um, what they need. So maybe they need more of an a la carte option or, you know, something different where we can still work together and it works for them and it works for me and we can maintain that relationship. And that's something where I didn't realize that, you know, 
you can go on two ends of the spectrum, right? You can be like, this is my value. This is my, um, you know, my, my work is worth this much. And I put this much time in and you can do that. And that's, and you should do that. But at the same time, not always at the expense of a relationship. Absolutely. What's the most rewarding part of your career, your job being an entrepreneur today? Being able to be a mom. That's like my big answer um, because I have the flexibility to work my schedule around my kids. So unless it's a meeting that I have to be at or, um, you know, specific things, deadlines and stuff, I can work around my kids. So their nap schedules, I work um, sometimes, you know, early in the morning or at nighttime, like I don't have to be on the clock and, you know, answer to somebody else as to like what I was doing between nine and five. So that is super rewarding to me that I can still be present as mom because I had a stay at home mom and it was awesome, but I don't necessarily want to give up everything um, right now. Um, but I do value my kids and time with them. So it's a balance. It's a good balance. So what's the biggest challenge then that you face right now? And it's probably going to be the same answer, right? Yeah, that's basically (laughs) the same answer. Um, Time. Time is a big challenge. Just having enough time for everything. And um, one thing that I've tried to work on, something I'm trying to work on, you know, to combat, you know, just not having enough time is learning how to say no. And that's really hard too, because I, as an entrepreneur, you have ideas, you have, you get energy from projects and you get energy from things and you see an opportunity and you're like, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity. I'm going to just do this and this and this, but then you don't have enough time for everything and you get burnt out or, you know, or you realize like, do I really like my kids are right here and they're super cute. And, you know, Casey, he's just walking and, you know, you want to do you, I want to do it all, at least me personally. Um, but I have tried to start saying no to things that, um, although they might sound like good opportunities, it's just not necessarily fitting in my life right now. So what's the biggest lesson that you've learned over your career because you've had you know your career has gone in different directions which so many do but what's your biggest lesson that that you've learned and and that has helped you as an entrepreneur I would say time managing your time is a huge lesson that I've learned that no one's holding your hand like in an office not that they hold your hand in an office but you have specific you know things that you need to do at a certain time, or, you know, you have maybe your boss is over here, you kind of looking out the window, you know, you have different, it's a different, a different atmosphere, I guess, in a traditional setting and knowing how to manage your own time is a huge learning curve. Um, if you, if you're like me and you kind of have all these ideas. So I've had to really, I've struggled with it, but I've learned how to manage my time better and more efficiently. And um, it's been a huge lesson that if you want to get anything done, especially with being a mom and um, trying to have a business, I have to manage my time because I might only get a couple hours here and there, chunks of time where I can, you know, work towards a deadline or, you know, work with a client and, and also cutting off, uh, conversations like if they need to stop after if it's one hour it needs to stop after one hour because you can't always go over because people like to talk right time management absolutely absolutely and what would be Allie a the best piece of advice you could give to somebody who is going to take the step I guess it's a twofold question Number one, somebody's going to take the step to become an entrepreneur and chase chase a dream. That's question number one. Question number two would be in the field you're in as an influencer. What advice can you give to somebody who's thinking about starting that? Um, so advice for somebody 
wanting to do what I do right now and then advice as an influencer. Yes. Um, I guess the advice that I would give for somebody just starting out doing what I do, trying to, you know, build a client list is, um, I guess, don't go to networking events for one, if, if you can, and don't, um, discredit a, a connection, right? So you meet people all the time, everywhere. I'm again, I'm going back to building relationships, right? You meet people all the time. And some, sometimes someone randomly, like someone I met on a plane was the editor of outdoor life. And then I got to do an article for them, you know, like things like that. Don't discredit just even just common conversations with people could be a business relationship eventually. So kind of being cognizant of that and how you present yourself um, day to day sometimes. Um, And then as far as influencer marketing, influencer stuff goes, I would just be authentic. I think people can see a lie and it's really annoying to to, uh, see people online saying one thing and doing another or um, just kind of not being themselves. And the truth to me always kind of comes out in some form or another. And just being true to yourself, it'll be a lot easier to to influence people, I guess, if that's what you're trying to do. Um, or, you know, have a online presence, digital marketing, right? Um, the authenticity will show. So Allie, the last couple of years, there's this thing out there that's been called COVID. Mm. Everybody's been affected, whether it's both professionally and personally professionally how has covid changed uh affected um helped or harmed your business all of the above you know i think and i think that it has actually at least initially it helped my business and in this i to explain that um a lot of people realize that they need a digital presence. They need marketing. They need um, some type of online presence to stay relevant even. Um, not One example, and this isn't a client, it's, it's a, a musician, a, a friend of mine. And he was like, I need help with my, with my um, building an online presence. Because I realized that I go, I haven't performed a show in a while. And now I have a child and I don't go out as much. So when I do go out, people assume me like, oh yeah, hey, we need to play together. Let's get out get you on the books. But otherwise this person doesn't, you know, like isn't seeing, he's not seen anywhere because he's not on social media, right? So he isn't getting gigs. It's like free advertising, you know? Okay. And so you, you, did you, you saw a lift in your business actually yes. early on? Yeah. Um, I saw that people were seeing the value in it and were asking more questions and were getting, um, and, and yes, I did get more business that way because they're like, Hey, you know, I need help. Can you help me kind of thing? And honestly, I haven't been the best even at advertising myself because I am too busy to advertise myself, which is fine because I, I don't really, like I said, I've been trying to say no. Um, yeah. So I did see a little lift in my business. Um, and people just really realized that they needed some digital marketing. People would ask me, um, you know, about content, about, um, you know, somehow boosting their business or websites. So, so many people need websites to be able to, you know, sell their product or, or whatever it is. There's, I do a few different things, email marketing, social media, influencer programs, things like that. Um, I've in the last, since COVID I've, I've done at least two different influencer programs that I run. Um, so yeah, it definitely, people are seeing the value. When I say influencer programs, before you even ask about that, it's, it's, um, that is a huge way to get the word out about your business is having ambassadors talking about it. Um, people that post about your product or, 
whatever it is, maybe your, your, your business, right. On, on social media. So it's just like word of mouth marketing, but online. So how, how do you go about doing that then? How do I go about, um, managing the programs or well, managing the programs, but getting, getting the people's message or their product to an influencer. And I'm assuming these are people then that have a lot of followers. Yeah. Some of them have a lot of followers. Some of them are really good at, they have, they might be more of a micro influencer. So they might not have thousands and thousands of followers, but the followers that they do have are super loyal. So their engagement is super high. Like they, they get a thousand likes per post, but they maybe only have 2000 or 3000 followers. It's just, it just depends on their engagement. Right. Um, okay. So with that, the way, what I look for, depending on the client. So if I work with an eyewear company, which I, which I do, um, they, they might want someone that, um, well, this eyewear company, for instance, is a safety glasses, shooting glasses company. So we're looking specifically for shooter people who like to shoot, um, for target, target rounds or hunting or whatever it is, right. Or shotgun sports. Um, and so we're looking for influencers in those types of realms, which is a lot easier to narrow it down. Right. Because if they're good at, you know, if they're good on social media and they like to shoot, then we probably want them on our team. Right. So, so yeah. Okay. So you, you do the contract services, you have a couple of large customers. Are you able to share with us some of some of the work you've done with some of these these larger customers you've dealt with that you just spoke to one of them, a shooting glass company? Yeah. Um, so um, SSP Eyewear, I've worked with since uh, 2018, um, and that's the the eyewear company, shooting glasses. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say they're a huge company, but they're competitive des- definitely with the the bigger brands, I, the products are, are great. Um, I would think they're, I would say they're better than some of the other, other brands out there. Um, but I also have done, uh, I did an ambassador program for Northland Outdoors, which is a, um, it's owned by Forum Communications. It would be like the outdoor section of the newspaper, but now digital. So like the Duluth News Tribune, for example, but the outdoor section was Northland Outdoors. And now they have a social uh, social media presence and an ambassador team, basically outdoor influencers that just post and, you know, tell outdoor stories. Right. So because it is a news, more of a news organization. So they're really looking for storytelling so that that would okay. be um, one. Um, and then I do I do work for um, Minnesota Whelan. So Minnesota Whelan is a magazine um, that's put on by the ATV Association of Minnesota and the Minnesota Four-Wheel Drive Association. And that is one that I, it's a bi-weekly or bi-monthly, sorry, um, magazine. And I edit it. So I edit it, put it together. I have a column um, and I'll fill in copy wherever I need to. And so that's a, a very deadline based client as well. Sure. So before we transition, cause we're going to go a little bit personal on you, ask sure. a couple personal questions here. Can you give our listeners all of your handles so they can find you, they can follow you. And if they wanted to do business with yeah. you, they can reach out and contact you. So what are all the social handles and all of that? Yeah. So um, my, so Ali up North on Instagram. So it's just Ali up North and Facebook. It's also Ali up North. And then there would be empower outdoors on Instagram and Facebook and Duluth farming co on Instagram and Facebook. So those are like the three ones, um, for, if you want to contact me, it'd be Ali up North or the Duluth farming co. Um, otherwise empower outdoors is kind of on social media, it's more of the inspire, empower, educate type content, not necessarily my business content. So, yeah. Perfect. 
So, all right, we, we're going to transition here to this section, Allie, that we call the packed questions. Okay. Set. Rapid fire. All right. All right. Outside of work, what's your favorite hobby? Oh, um, okay. I love hunting, fishing, <laughs> hiking, All right. singing. What, what, what are you doing this week? What, what did you do this morning? Oh, yeah. Literally, before I came here, I was turkey hunting. I was, um, I'm here in Moose Lake. I'm sitting in the, uh, the Moose Lake library or community center or city council or something. I'm sitting here, um, because I had to leave my hunting shack. My family's all there. Um, and I came here to do this podcast. So it was better than driving all the way home and they have good internet. Well, we truly appreciate you taking time uh, to do this with us when you're uh, with your family at your hunting camp. So any turkeys this morning? No. I, well, I saw three hens, a lot of deer, and my mom actually shot a turkey yesterday. All right. Yeah. It was, it was a 20 pound Tom. Big old Tom. Yeah. Perfect. What is Allie's favorite movie? Oh, goodness. I don't ever rewatch movies. That's, I mean, I guess that's what I can give you. I don't rewatch movies because I like new movies. So I like romantic comedies. I don't have a favorite. If uh, Come on. If there was one that you're going to cheat and watch a second time, there's got to be one. Oh, Mean Girls. <laughs> okay, there it is. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's just funny. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you talked about some music in your family. Yeah. So what's your, your favorite artist or band? You know, um, in the past, Creedence Clearwater Revival. I love their sound, but right now, cause it changes all the time, right? My favorite artist changes. Cody Johnson is one that I just love right now. So yeah. And Allie? What's the best piece of advice you have ever received in your life? Oh, you know, my dad always told me, and this relates to job, right? Your job, but be so valuable in your work that they can't afford to lose you, right? I feel like I applied that to my life in a few different ways. But um, especially with work, because it doesn't just mean putting in overtime. It's the true added value. It's like the unique way that you see the world and the work that you put in and the difference that you make and all that. So, yeah. That is awesome. And folks, our special guest today, and Allie, we thank you so much, is Allie Jutine, influencer of Allie Up North, owner of Empower Outdoors, a family member of DuluthFarming.co, where you're going to be able to buy really, really good beef coming up here shortly. So we're going to be watching for that. Allie, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's been it. a lot of fun. We've learned a lot. Thanks again. <laughs> and folks, until next time, unplug from the indoors and recharge in the outdoors, doors, doors, doors.